lesson from Luke. It makes me think of a song of theirs called Silent House. It was written about a mother or grandmother with Alzheimer's disease, but it really could be any mental illness. The chorus goes like this. And I will try to connect all the pieces you left. I will carry it on and let you forget. And I'll remember the years when your mind was clear, how the laughter and life filled up this silent house. Well, we don't know if the man had family, even though after he's healed, Jesus tells him to return to his home. But there's no question that when there is mental illness, there is a hole in families. There may have been a time, once upon a time, when his mind was clear. He may have left a spouse or parents or children who miss his presence, who remember the way things used to be, although he can't, or is too distracted, or doesn't value those things while he's sick. But as for him and his current condition, definitely no silent house. In order for there to be silence, a person has to be alone sometimes. But when Jesus asks him his name, he replies, Legion, which means many. He feels as if he has thousands of demons or spirits or fractions of his personality patrolling all of his thoughts and actions. He lives in absolute chaos in the tombs of the city. And whether he himself has chosen to live there or has been forced by the people in the town to live there, there's no denying that he feels dead. To complete the picture, he's completely naked. The anonymous man, the man unclothed as at the extremes of life, birth and death. Living on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, bodies of water were considered to be where the sea monster Leviathan a true place of mystery and the unknown. So Jesus enters into this setting by stepping out of the boat. In the story before this one, he has calmed the wind and the sea and the disciples' fears. He's shown that he has power over nature and the wild. Now he encounters life-destroying evil. The evil spirits in this man identify Jesus and ask not to be tormented. At this point, they ask to be allowed to enter a herd of pigs. Jesus is definitely in Gentile territory because pigs were and are considered unclean by the Jewish people. The possessed pigs rush into the sea, freeing those spirits to return to the chaotic, unconscious, primordial element of the water. Jesus shows here again that he has tremendous power and truly is in the demon's own words the son of the most high God. And then the story gets even more interesting. The witnesses of these things, the swine herds, rush off to tell others what they have seen but not understood. A whole crowd of people returns to see the man clothed and in his right mind and sitting at Jesus' feet in the attitude of a disciple. Now, do they celebrate the healing and restoration of the man and the restoration of their community? Do they praise God and Jesus the healer? No, they're afraid. They're unable and unwilling to comprehend these things. They ask Jesus to leave. The reality they've been accustomed to has changed. They were used to the man being mentally ill, living outside the city, living outside of relationships with others and maybe being an object of fear and control, like a scapegoat. And Jesus has given the man his dignity back. He's taken away from the man's point of view, awful fear, the vulnerability and exclusion, and clothed him with health and sanity. The man is now capable of making decisions for himself, learning and growing. He's above all grateful. He pleads with Jesus to take him along, but Jesus directs him to go home. He's been restored to himself and the community, but he must take the healing home and witness about the change in his life and the one who loved him enough to heal him. He's been clothed in Christ. Paul in Galatians also speaks of being clothed in Christ through our baptism. He then says there is no longer Jew or Greek 
There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So is this clothing like a uniform? If these polarizing categories no longer distinguish us from each other, if so, what might this uniform look like? When I was a seminary intern many years ago, that is, assigned to a congregation for a year to learn more about pastoral ministry, I was assigned to be supervised by a pastor who was very different from me. He was big and blunt and loud. He told me once that he was used to interns that he could beat a bracket I couldn't do much except shrug. I didn't play racquetball, and if I did, I probably wouldn't have played with him. But even with that foreshadowing, I was caught off guard by his final evaluation. Now, the Lutheran Church had only been ordaining women for 13 years, and I was probably idealistic and naive, but I thought I'd learned a lot and had put it to good use in the congregation. There were people who were supportive and seemed to understand what I would become. But when I read his final evaluation, he called my leadership style feminine frailty. I'll never forget. <laughs> In my mind, I swung between self criticism and extreme vulnerability to a firm belief that his words were sexist and were only a confirmation of how little he understood me and what women clergy were like. Amen. <laughs>
each gathering together, Jesus reminds us, return to your home. 